Uh, before we start, there's just a couple of things I'd like to read from this game's Wikipedia page. Let's see. This is in relation to the game's um, main designer, Lee Sheldon. Sheldon strived to make the puzzles a seamless part of the game's environment and plot, and hoped that they wouldn't seem tacked on or simply for the sake of a puzzle. <laughs> And let's just go to the uh, review section. The puzzle aspects of And Then There Were None received varying reactions. Game Over called the few puzzles in the game bad, complaining that often the puzzles were obscure and illogical. Game Over complained that many puzzles did not advance the plot and led to nothing. GameSpot criticized the puzzles in And Then There Were None, saying that the player is regularly tasked with backtracking back and forth across the island with only a vague notion of what to do in order to progress the story. Nonsense. <laughs> there was no aspect of that in Lies this game. Lies and balderdash. <laughs> <sighs> We're not done yet, are we? So, after uh, recovering from all of that... <laughs> You may have noticed at the end of the last video there was a loading screen. Um, unfortunately, I've lost the footage of what happens after that, but, well, we can actually recreate most of it. Yes. Basically, Mr. Morris turns up on the gramophone and informs us that we're not quite finished yet. We can experience the story as Agatha Christie truly intended. We have one final challenge. Silence, please. I have prepared a special reward for you. The original ending to our little story is somewhat different than the one you have just experienced. If you can complete a final puzzle, childishly simple really, you will be able to learn the original solution to And Then There Were None, as Dame Agatha Christie first wrote it. Interested? Then your first step is to make your way to the dining room for a final treat. And if you make your way to the dining room, you'll find... Dun-dun-dun... Where is it? <laughs> oh wow, did we actually not pick it up? <laughs> so, we are going to make our way to the dining room. <laughs> yeah, just pretend that, don't, that didn't happen. <laughs> Some uh, way we can edit wow. this or something. <laughs> you know, in the original, was Narakot even here? Oh, there we go. That's it. In the original, there was no Narakot. The last little sailor boy. He was hopelessly shoehorned into the plot. Yes. <laughs> the story as Dame Agatha Christie intended. Narakot, please go into the dining room. <laughs> One quick four. Um, you know how we found a Gabrielle Steele film reel earlier on and then chucked it away? Yeah. If we'd watched it, would we have just seen Gabrielle Steele and realised um, she was pretending to be Emily Brent? Oh my god, that's the video that Narragot threw away randomly. Yes. And we would have seen that, oh, gee, she looks an awful lot like a younger Miss Brent. I'd like I wonder who it could be! <laughs> Oh, I'd like to say if you try using, um, if you try going into any of the other rooms, Narakot says I'm meant to be elsewhere or something like okay, that. So we're in. Here. Is there a video? We have to. I don't know. Hit it with the soldier boy or something. Locked. Locked. So it's locked. What could we? Second draw. Yeah. If you look here closely, can you see how yeah. faint that is? There's a little that indentation. That is very that, that is fairly ridiculous. Because you could just push it down with something else. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> and now we can watch the true solution. We have to put it in. I know. There you go. Where is it? Uh. Hmm. Go left again. There ah, it is. Here we go. Yeah. The film has been spooled. Why do you sound confused? You're the man that did it. Three days. Oh damn, maybe I should have put down... You should have uh, put down the projector. <laughs> <laughs> this is sinister. You know, that still makes no sense. I wonder what that was all about. What? What? Oh dear. We've broken it. <laughs> that still makes no sense, yeah. in the least. Because it, sh it should have projected it onto this blank wall. Isn't there a switch somewhere near the door or something? What's there? I don't uh, know. What's... Hmm. This is What's certainly that a clue of some sort. Aisle? Oh, that, oh, it's holding up the chair. Never mind. Apparently, yes. Hmm. Mm. Thrill as we try and figure out how to move down the projector screen. Damn it. <laughs> Go back, then. <sighs> okay. Nope. No, that's not it. 
No, 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 Near no. Near the top. Oh, ah. See, that's really vague. Is that out of his reach? <laughs> Marvel as Maricot uses his telekinesis. Ah, here we go. Okay, video. The true ending of And Then There Were None. From my earliest youth, I realized that my nature was a mass of contradictions. I have an incurably romantic imagination, and it was for this reason that I adopted a rather childish and unreliable approach, writing my confession, enclosing it in a bottle, and casting it into the waves. There is a hundred to one chance that this confession may be found, and then a hitherto unsolved murder mystery will be explained. Another trait born of my contradictory nature is my sadistic delight in causing death. From an early age, I knew very strongly the lust to kill. And yet, I was also indoctrinated with a strong sense of justice. I have always felt that the innocent should be spared and the guilty punished. With this mental makeup, it was inevitable that I would adopt the law as my profession. After ascending to the bench, I found that most of my baser desires were quenched in a legal and just way. And yet of late, I have felt a nagging urge, one that will not free me from its insistent grip. That is the urge to commit a murder myself. I fancied myself an artist in crime, and my imagination whacked secretly to this colossal force. However, I was restrained by my innate sense of justice. The innocent must not suffer. And then quite suddenly, the solution came to me. I would punish those that the law could not touch. In my years on the bench, there were many cases that frustrated my will, cases wherein I knew the accused to be guilty, and yet the evidence was such that he could never be convicted. Cases of deliberate murder that were quite untouchable within the confines of the law. So I determined to commit not just one murder, but murder on a grand scale. A childish rhyme of my infancy came back to me. The rhyme of the ten little sailor boys. Something about it fascinated me. The inexorable diminishment. The sense of inevitability. And so I began, secretly, to collect victims. I will not go into detail about how this was accomplished. Suffice to say, I was convinced of the guilt of every one of my victims and I knew enough about them via my connections to be able to lure each one to Shipwreck Island with an appropriate bait. And now to the mechanics of the actual crime. In what I took as a sign, none of my plans misfired and all of my guests arrived at Shipwreck Island on the 8th of August. The party included myself. The order of the deaths were dictated by what I viewed as my victims' varying degrees of guilt. Those whose guilt was lightest should go first, and not suffer the increasing mental strain and fear reserved for the more cold-blooded offenders. The first death had already occurred. Archibald Morris, a shady little dope peddler, had set up the details for me renting the island, sending the letters, and recording the gramophone record before I ended his life with a dose of potassium cyanide. Anthony Marsden and Mrs. Rogers died next, one instantaneously, the other in a peaceful sleep. Marsden's crime was one of circumstance and his amoral nature. Mrs. Rogers, I had no doubt, acted largely under the influence of her husband. Their murders were the easiest. Poison easily slipped into a glass for each of them, as at this point no one had any reason to be suspicious. General Mackenzie met his death quite painlessly and never heard me approach. 
I am convinced that he was dead long before he ever came to Shipwreck Island. At this point, I found it necessary to recruit an ally. Dr. Armstrong seemed the most suited to this task, as it was inconceivable to him that a man of my standing could be a murderer. He was taken in with no resistance. I killed Rogers on the morning of the 10th. He too did not hear me approach. During the chaos arising from finding his body, I slipped into Lombard's room and abstracted his revolver. At breakfast, I slipped my last dose of poison into Miss Brent's coffee. It was enough to render her unconscious, and I returned a short time later to inject a strong dose of cyanide into her. It was just after this that I intimated to Armstrong that we must carry our plan into effect, that I must appear to be the next victim. This would, perhaps, rattle the murderer, and at any rate, would allow me to move about the house and spy on whom I wished. A gunshot and some red mud on the forehead was all it took. After all, it was only Armstrong who examined me closely. After returning the revolver to Lombard's room, I had a rendezvous set up with Armstrong on the edge of a cliff. He was still quite unsuspicious, although he ought to have been warned by the nursery rhyme, a red herring swallowed one. Once at the cliff, I uttered an exclamation, leaned over the cliff. Wasn't that the mouth of a cave? He leaned right over. A swift push sent him quickly into the heaving sea below. He took the red herring all right. And now came the moment I had anticipated. Three people who were so frightened of each other that anything might happen. And one of them had a revolver. I watched them from the windows of the house. When Bloor came up alone, I had the big marble clock poised ready. Exit Bloor. From my window, I saw Vera shoot Lombard. I always thought she was a match for him and more. I then immediately set the stage in her bedroom. It was an interesting experiment. Would the knowledge of her own guilt, the hypnotic suggestion of her surroundings, and the nervous tension of having just shot a man be enough to coerce her into taking her own life? It was. Vera Claythorne hanged herself before my very eyes as I stood in the shadow of the wardrobe. And now I shall finish writing this. I shall enclose it and seal it in a bottle and throw the bottle into the sea. Why? Yes. Why? I suppose I have a pitiful human wish that someone should know just how clever I have been. I must go now and finish this. It is essential that my body be found in accordance with the record kept by my fellow victims. My own life is of no consequence. My doctors tell me I have a month to live at most. I do not wish to die the death of the invalid patient, steeped to the gills in drugs, culminating in a complete loss of human dignity. I will instead be found laid neatly in my bed, shot through the forehead. When the sea goes down, there will come from the mainland boats and men, and they will find ten dead bodies and an unsolved problem on Shipwreck Island. Signed, Lawrence Wargrave. Wow. Well, that happened. <laughs> well, do you see why I'm a little concerned as to why they changed the ending? Yes, <laughs> you see. Ag with that's Christie's original, it's very good. It makes a lot of sense. You can work it out with the information given. The first sign something was very clearly wrong was when they were hinting in the game that Wargrave had faked his death. Yeah. There's next to no indication of it in the book. Yeah. 
Well, it's just kind of really... It was the first ridiculous circumstance when we got hit in the head, and everyone had no idea what happened. For what it's worth, I truly love this game once you know where you're meant to be on the island. Oh yeah, without all the backtracking and searching for the single plot point on the island, just move it along a little bit. It's great. It's great fun. Generally, this game got a lot of criticisms for its animation and poor graphics, but that kind of adds to the fun. Pish posh, the animation is extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. <sighs> Uh, voice acting's really good as well. Yeah, the voice acting receives strong praise. Mm. It was just from... Uh, yeah, it was all fine until the grand reveal. Ten minutes of exposition and just... The end. This was how it should have gone. But we needed to shoehorn an extra character in there. Mm. We, we should have just played as Lombard. Mm, Let's should. face it, he was the penultimate one to die. So, playing as him, it would have worked out. We could have tried to solve it before... Hmm. If we were trying to yeah. um, do it, it wouldn't have been a very happy ending, granted. We, no. um, we were just wandered around the island until we walk under the doorway to the house and there's like, BONG! And you're dead. <laughs> yeah. If you play as Lombard, what they could have done is you have to gather enough evidence and work it out and then the final boss battle is trying to convince Vera not to shoot you. Hmm. You say, no, wait, it must have been... Justice Wargrave who's standing over there next to the cupboard. Yes. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. Yeah, it was good. That was fun. The, um, all games, the people behind this, did make others. Yes. So we might be looking at those later. Until now, it's been a lot of fun. Goodbye. Yay.